Second City by D School. Um, and if you want, you can download slides. There's fewer slides today than usual, but if you want to go to the bit.ly link, Stanford MOC5, you can zoom ahead as we often joke if you get uh, bored and you want to see what slides are coming up by the end of the talk. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to get to introduce um, our two guest speakers. We've got Kelly Leonard, who's the executive director of Second City. He's also the author of this fantastic book called Yes And. I highly recommend it. And Piero Procaccini, who's the director of improv at Second City. And they are going to immerse us in some of the fundamental techniques of the improviser's mindset, which probably if you're here on, the, uh, on this session with us, uh, is no news to you, but it's not just about creating comedy. It's also about divergent thinking, about exploring possibilities, about collaborative idea generation. And Piero and Kelly are world-renowned experts in the subject. So it's my distinct pleasure to get in introduce them. And I would like to hand over the floor to my friend, Kelly Leonard. Hi, everybody. So, so happy to be here with you. Uh, so let's, I'm going to start with a story. Um, so it's about 15 years ago, and I'm in my office at the Second City, and it's a Friday late in the day, and I'm packing up my stuff. And my son, Nick, who's 10 at the time, is completing his first week of improv classes. Um, and here's what you need to know about Nick at that time. In addition to being 10 years old, um, he's chubby. He's got weird theater parents, so he's kind of a weird theater kid, and he gets bullied at school. Um, but this week has been amazing, and we get in the car, and we're leaving Second City Garage, and he says to me, Dad, do you know what I love about improv classes? And I go, no, buddy. What do you love about improv classes? He goes, an improv, if you're nice and you're funny, you're popular. That has stuck with me to this day, because that's the world I want to live in. So I started at Second City in 1988, and my first gig uh, out of college was as a dishwasher, which is not as glamorous as, as it sounds. Uh, the back bar in those days was filled with alcoholics and sociopaths. I am not making that up. Um, fun note, uh, the other guy who got hired as a dishwasher that week was John Favreau, uh, the film director, uh, and we both had mullets. Uh, there is photographic evidence of both those things. My wife has a picture in her office of both of us with our mullets. Um, and even though the job was terrible at, at that point, the cool thing was you got to step out and watch the show. Um, and I don't know if you know how Second City is set up, but we do two acts of scripted content and then a third act that is improvised, that is completely made up. And it feels like magic. Uh, and, and I should note at the time that uh, in 88, uh, on the resident stages at Second City included Mike Myers uh, and Bonnie Hunt. Uh, Jane Lynch was in our Second City ETC cast. Uh, Chris Farley had just been hired in the Turing Company and was constantly get, getting in trouble for breaking things. Uh, and he would do the improv set and that means it was just like a ball of, of energy. Um, so it feels like magic. Uh, but then you work here a while and you start to understand the undergirdings of improvisation and it's not magic at all. Uh, improv is yoga for your social skills. Improv is loud, noisy group mindfulness. Improvisation is a practice in being unpracticed, which is how we walk through the world every single day. If it surprises you to hear that, it might not if you knew the origin stories of this work, because it starts in the 20s and 30s with a woman named Viola Spolin, who is a social worker working at Jane Addams Hull House on the south side of Chicago. And her job was to better assimilate the immigrant children coming into her care. Uh, and so she created these exercises, these games, that allowed them to communicate and collaborate and empathize. A lot of these games were in gibberish or silence because the kids didn't always share language. They came from all over the world. Viola's son, Paul Sills, was studying at the University of Chicago. He loved these games. He taught them to his friends, Mike Nichols, Elaine May, Alan Arkin, among others. And they formed the first improvisational theater in America in 1957 called the Compass Players, pure improvisation. That morphs into the second city, which uses improvisation to then create finely honed sketches in 1959. All right, so flash, flash forward to 1992, uh, and I become the producer of Second City. 
far too young. I was 26. I had no reason getting the job other than, I don't know, long story, but I become the producer uh, of Second City. And I start to really get into the bones of the work. And I was very blessed because I was able to, in the, my first hiring session, I hired Tina Fey, um, uh, Stephen Colbert, Steve Carell, not all at the same audition, uh, but in the first few, uh, few years, then worked with people and hired people like Amber Ruffin and Jason Sudeikis, and the list goes on and on. The 90s and the aughts were incredible. Um, flash forward to 2015, that's when I write the book, Yes And. Um, so uh, I, I actually went on book tour. And here's, here's the thing about uh, when you go on book tour, uh, when, you could, when you could go on book tours. And any author who tells you they don't do this is lying. You always go into the local bookstore and look to see if your book is there. And since I wrote a business book, I'd be looking in, in that business section. Um, and so I go and see if that's there. And then I'd see what else is on the shelves. And I started to get some different ideas about like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And a lot of these books mention improvisation, but don't go sort of deep in it. And when I got back off book tour, I actually decided to, I had a midlife crisis, let's be honest total midlife crisis, I stepped down from my position at Second City as producer. And luckily the owner at the time uh, knew I was unhirable. Uh, so he said, hey, why don't you take a year, we'll pay you and you can either build a bridge out or a bridge in. Uh, and I was like, ah, this is an incredible opportunity. So I got a new office like right next to his in the front of Second City. Um, I uh, go on vacation, I'm gonna come back and sort of figure out what my new world is. I'm in Michigan on vacation. And I get a text, your office is on fire. Now I work at Second City, so I'm just assuming that's not true until I got a phone call going, no, your office is on fire. So I don't know if you, Second City caught fire uh, in, in 2016 and <clears throat> it directly went through my office. It was a, a, above a, uh, a Mexican restaurant and destroyed pretty much everything. I have a couple of things over here that, that survived the fire, but, but that's it. So. I got moved, uh, Second City was saved, the, the stages, but, but my group, uh, uh, me, the owner, and then the corporate group uh, all got moved to uh, temporary offices. So I'm in these temporary offices and I'm now trying to figure out like what is my job gonna be? And the guy who runs Second City Works, which is the corporate division, the group that brings this work into businesses all over the world, he says to me, well, you created a bunch of stuff when you were a producer. You did like I did uh, mashups with like Hubbard Street Dance and Lyric Opera on the Toronto Symphony. He goes, who would you collaborate with if you were going to do work with us? And I thought back to those bookstore visits. And one of the things that I noticed was there was a lot of book on the books on the art of negotiation. And so I was like, hey, what if we found an academic who is an expert in negotiation and we created a, a course with them using improv? Um, and, and I remember that Dan Pink, uh, who I know had, had, was a lawyer, and he, had, he loves improv and thinks it's really valuable and talked about it as, as a lawyer using it in negotiation. So Steve, my boss says, that's great, that, uh, go, go do it. So I go to my computer and I Google academic negotiation Chicago, and the first five professors that come up, I email them. Uh, four of them get back to me right away. Three of them like want to do it right away. So it's about a week later, and I'm about to finalize the deal with this professor at Loyola. I tell the story a lot, and I always feel bad about this woman because she, I ended up not working with her. Because the fifth professor from the University of Chicago, Eugene Crusoe, he emailed me. He's like, hey, sorry to get back to you. Are you still interested in talking? So old Kelly would have blown this off because I had my bird in hand, but I'm going through this Shonda Rhyme year of yes bullshit in my life. So I'm like, yes, I'm open to the experience. I'll come meet with you. Because Graham gonna invite my wife, Heather, I think she'd be interested. So I tool over to the campus at the University of Chicago. I go into their office and uh, uh, Eugene like could care less what I'm talking about. I'm doing my rap on improv, but Heather is locked in. And when I finish, she goes, Kelly, we're both behavioral scientists. We have decades and decades of research that show us that people make terrible decisions for themselves. You have an art form and a practice that will allow them to make better decisions for themselves. Those two things have never been put together before. Uh, her boss at the time was Richard Thaler, the Nobel Prize winning economist. He greenlit the Second Science Project, which is a program that Piero worked on, uh, which looks at behavioral science through the lens of improvisation and improvisation through the lens of science. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is pass it over to Piero, because one of the first things we've mentioned, yes, and write the title of my book uh, on the one of the very first sessions with uh, these scholars was they said, can you teach us an exercise 
which is sort of your core exercise that, that people, and, and then we can look and see if there's some science around why it's effective or why it works. Uh, Pierre, I'm gonna to toss to you. Great, thank you, Kelly. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Super excited to be here. Uh, and uh, yeah, like Kelly mentions, you know, improv is experiential, so we are going to uh, put you through an experience. So this is your opportunity uh, to turn your cameras on or to get ready to turn your cameras on because it will be more of an immersive, fun experience for you if you are able to see each other. Um, you're about to be sent into some breakouts to run this exercise uh, together with a few other people. Um, depending on the numbers, uh, I, I, I think it's probably going to end up being somewhere around four to five people per breakout. Um, and again, if you can turn your cameras on, uh, please do. Either way, you'll be um, uh, unmuting and talking to each other in these breakouts. And here's what you're, here's what you're about to do. Very simple, uh, straightforward um, uh, exercise here. In these breakouts, uh, you'll start by deciding uh, <laughs> people just left the meeting. Oh, there goes one of our breakouts. Um, uh, you'll start by deciding in these breakouts, who is person A, B, C, D, and so on, just so that you have an order that you'll be going in. You'll always go in that order, A, B, C, D, however many people there are, back to A. And you'll always keep uh, contributing in that order uh, and uh, uh, always, again, circling back to A whenever you've gotten through everybody. Uh, in this first round, uh, you'll go in, you'll quickly decide that order, and then person A is going to start uh, by suggesting an idea uh, for uh, a vacation that everyone's going to take post-pandemic. A uh, couple quick guidelines here. There are no budgetary constraints to this vacation, so you have unlimited budget. Uh, you're welcome to go wherever you'd like to go, do whatever you'd like to do, uh, and also you are not constrained by the laws of time and space. So uh, if you'd like to go back to the past, visit uh, a, an era that you, you know, that you would like to go to, or in the future, if you'd like to have a party on the moon, uh, wherever you'd like to take this vacation, you are welcome to do so. Person A, you are going to suggest these ideas uh, to your group. Uh, everyone else in this uh, breakout is going to respond to all of these ideas with no because and a reason why, okay? So no because and a reason why. Person A will suggest an idea. B will say no because and a reason why. C will say no because a reason why to person A's idea. D will do the same and so on and so forth. Person A, when it comes back to you, you are welcome to react however you like. Uh, however, you must continue to contribute ideas in, uh, in, in, in an effort to plan this vacation. Everyone else will respond with no because. Let me pause and see if there are any questions. Go ahead and put those in the chat if you, do, if you have any. Um, okay, great. So sure, I'll, I'll review it one more time. Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, many different vacations, if you like. Uh, it, really, it's totally up to you. But person A is going to suggest ideas. Everyone else is going to say no because and a reason why. So decide on an order, A, B, C, D, and so forth in these breakouts. Person A will suggest an idea for a vacation or something you can do. B, C, D, everyone else is going to respond with no because in this initial round, in this first round. Decide an order and then uh, jump in with A, suggesting ideas, and everyone else saying no because to those ideas. All right, uh, okay. a, please, person A, especially, please remember this experience. We're gonna come back and talk about it in just a moment. Uh, and in, you're only in these breakouts for a few minutes. So uh, jump right in, decide that order, and then person A, get ready to pitch that idea uh, and, and everyone else get ready to say no because and a reason why. And folks, just so you know, I put in chat what Piero just said because you yes. can select your chat even when you're in the breakout room. So you'll be able to see the uh, instructions if you missed it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. All right, sure. on your mark, get set to the breakouts. All right, welcome back folks. People starting to come back in. Welcome back from these breakouts. Welcome back. Uh, I'm seeing some smiling faces. I'm glad it wasn't too terribly painful on people. This is great. We don't know awesome. that. We don't know, <laughs> we don't know, we don't know the, the cause of those smiles. That's a good point. Um, okay, great. So as people are coming back in, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Folks are coming back in to the main session. Um, fantastic. So we are going to talk about that experience. So just have a have sort of have a, an internal reflection about that experience, both what it was like to hear and say no. So for person A, you're going to be a pivotal figure in this exercise because we are going to send you now back into these same breakouts one more time. Uh, same setup. Person A, you're going to suggest ideas for this vacation, for this trip you're going to take. Um, 
in this round, person A is going to start, and you're going to suggest these ideas. In this round, uh, person B, C, D, and so on, you all are all, are all going to respond with yes and you're going to add something. So you'll say yes and you're going to add something to that idea. You'll keep going in a circle. So person uh, A will suggest an idea. Person B will say yes and they'll add something to the idea. Person C will, will do the same and so on and so forth. Person A, when it comes back to you, you're going to keep contributing ideas in the same way. Everyone will keep yes anding around the circle. Um, again, starting with A, uh, you don't have to stick to the same vacation. You can start a brand new one. Same uh, principles are in place. Uh, no budgetary constraints, no uh, constraints based on the laws of, of physics. Uh, and we're going to compare these two rounds for you, compare some of the, uh, uh, the experiences within these two rounds. Uh, any questions before I, we jump into these breakouts? All right, you're off on round two. This is our yes and round. And welcome back everyone else who's coming back to us at the moment. I'm yep. seeing all these uh, rooms close and people returning. Fantastic, okay, welcome back. So now we've had two rounds. Uh, person A, thank you for uh, taking the leap for us and being our, our starting point. Um, in particular, so I would love to hear from everybody in that chat. Uh, what was your experience comparing round one to round two? What did you start to notice was different in round two versus round one? Um, it's a stirring experience. Thank you, Bridget. That's awesome. Um, and uh, uh, let me see by a show of hands just visually. Where are my person A's? Who is person A in their group? Awesome. Um, if you would be comfortable, I would love for a few person A's to, to digitally raise your hand so you come right to the top of my screen uh, and unmute and share what your experience was. Let's start with that no round. So what was your experience receiving no uh, to all of your uh, suggestions? Um, Tao, if you're comfortable, you were the first person to raise your hand. I'll, I'll call on you first. What was your experience uh, receiving no to all of your ideas in that first round? I, it was, even though I knew it was a game, it was surprisingly <laughs> useful. Like the, the entire goal was for everyone to reject every single word I yeah. had. Right. It By doesn't design. matter that it's a game. It's still, yes. it's still rejection. Right. It's still rejection. It still has that same emotional toll, right? Exactly. Um, and uh, uh, what was the difference for you when we, when we entered into round two there, when you when your ideas were, people responded with yes and? Everyone was happier. Yeah. Like, just, but everyone was finally like, yes, yes, this is a much better mood. And now I'm going to talk about how that idea of yours was actually a really good idea. And there's this other stuff we could get. So while well, in the first round, it was like, oh, so how can I get as far away from all of these ideas? Because none of them are mm -hmm. quite right. In the second round, like everything was terrific. And by the end, we were sitting in someone's yard in France, eating salad from their garden. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Uh, terrific. Uh, let me just take one, maybe one more uh, person. Anyone want to physically raise your hand? I'll call on you. Uh, Michael? Yeah, what was your experience in that in, in person A? Uh, yeah, so I found that the um, the no's were actually faster than the yeses. Uh, mm -hmm. People tended to think a little bit harder than on the yeses than on the no's because I would be like, oh, I want to go to like Jordan. And it's like, bam, bam, bam. Yes. Yes. You know, so you can really get the negative attention much faster than you can get the positive reaction. And what was that effect on your idea generation as the person who kept receiving now? Um, I feel like when it's like faster, it just was like, oh, you get a little bit more retractive. <laughs> yeah, uh, but when it's just kind of slower, you're just kind of like hanging in the air, like, let's go to Paris. And you're like, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, great. Well, so again, and just for the same time, thank you so much to all these, all, all our person A's uh, for volunteering and for being the, uh, the, the sort of the representative in each group. Um, I love these comments that are coming in in the chat and I wanna address some of them real quick. So um, uh, this idea of a lot of people have sh sort of weighed in with round two being more fun or easier. And I think that's really valid. I think in many cases that's the case. Um, and there's also this thing of you do there you do there's some work to be done in round two you actually do have to I also saw in the chat this idea of like you have to sort of work harder to avoid criticism you have to work harder to sort of look for the positive in ideas versus the negative um, and also I'll, I'll, I'll highlight Dan's uh, comment here which is this idea that like staying on the same thread rather than jumping to a new topic 
and, and yes, so there's this idea of, I, I, I love this, this point uh, that was made by Michael, uh, momentum is a really, really key factor here, right? Which is to say, no is easy to say, but it doesn't have a lot of momentum beyond it, right? So when you have a room full of people who are saying no, it's easy for all those people to say no. And then it starts becoming harder and harder and harder and harder. The, the, the longer we, we go and no, the more things slow down. And there's a direct parallel in real life. Um, we are not saying that uh, to never say no, actually. No is a really valuable, healthy thing to say. It sets appropriate boundaries. Um, and in real life, those boundaries are really important. You know, mom, can I go run in the street? Well, no is the right answer to that question, right? Uh, there, there are time, there's a time and place where no is absolutely appropriate. What we want to acknowledge, though, is that, that uh, yes and a no have repercussions. And typically, no, the repercussions of no is that it, uh, it ultimately uh, slows idea generation. Uh, it, it can, it can uh, bring things more to a standstill, which oftentimes is appropriate because it slows us down to keep us safe. Um, with yes and, you may have found the opposite effect. Why, so again, going back to Michael's point, while, while you may be taking more time in each of those answers, each of those answers is leading to more acceleration of the whole process itself. Those ideas are flowing. Uh, there's less sort of judgment in the room. I'm not guarded about the ideas I'm putting out there. Yet you're, you're less guarded about the ideas you're putting out there. It does require relinquishing some control over where you think this is gonna go. Uh, so that's sort of the trade-off there. But if you can commit to that, the, it, it, yes and accelerates. Uh, and that acceleration can sometimes be scary. It can put us in a place of, whoa, this is going too fast. Uh, let me, let, you know, let's, let's slow it down. In our world, uh, what's really important is that the scene always has to move forward. Because if the scene stops moving forward, we lose our audience, they lose interest in what we're doing, and we've totally lost them. So for us, um, no is what we would call poison to our scenes because it, it slows us down, it brings things to a halt, uh, and yes and is really the, the cornerstone because of that acceleration aspect. We always have to be looking forward, moving forward, uh, seeking opportunity. The other thing that you may notice is that no often invokes a fight or flight response, right? It's, it's this idea of I'm either going to, uh, you know, when I keep hearing no, especially again and again and again, maybe I can respond to it once. But if I hear no again and again and again, multiple times, if I'm in an environment of no, I tend to shut down. I either tend to get, start giving up on my ideas or I dig my heels and I say, my ideas are good, uh, but they're, but you're not gonna support them. And so I'm gonna sort of fight for my ideas. And that also means that I'm probably gonna fight you on your ideas uh, by default, because I see you sort of in this adversarial role. Uh, yes and for us becomes really vital to collaboration. Uh, it, it is this idea of, we describe it as bring a brick, not a cathedral, which means you're gonna bring an idea, I'm gonna bring an idea, you're gonna bring an idea, and I'm gonna bring an idea. We're gonna build this thing little by little by little together. Um, relinquishing some of that control of where this is going to go, because we know that the end product is going to be is going to benefit from that uh, from that process. But we also recognize that in real life, uh, you know, we have a luxury on stage that doesn't exist in real life, and that I can on stage agree to a reality. If you say to me, "Let's jump out of a, a plane without a parachute," I can say yes to that idea, and I won't. I will still walk away from that scene. In the real world, that's not always the case. Again, like we mentioned, no, these boundaries of no become really important. So we have to get to this underlying idea of yes and of as a philosophy rather than a phrase. The yes and philosophy does not necessarily equate to agreement. It does not mean that I have to agree with your idea or that I have to go along. What it, what it means is how am I entering into that conversation? Am I entering into that conversation with an open mindset, ready to hear ideas, ready to better try, work to better understand you and then respond and add my piece? Great, that's a yes and philosophy. But even if I'm saying the words yes and I don't mean them, if I'm saying them insincerely, that's still uh, creating that sort of no environment that can be really, really challenging. Uh, and let me throw back to Kelly to talk a little bit about sort of where we've gone with that in the Second Science Project. Yeah, so what's interesting about when we did that exercise for uh, these scholars, immediately Richard Thaler is like, well, this is behavioral economics. We understand that people's default position is to say no or do nothing. And yes and is essentially a nudge to move people in the opposite direction to also create from abundance. That's that, and that is key to, to our work. So then the question was posited, um, okay, what happens when you have a central disagreement uh, where you can't yes and? What, what, what is sort of, so when we do this exercise, broadly speaking, we have, we do the no, we do like a yes but, and then we do a yes and. So what's, what's the fourth? Um, and they went away and looked at research and we sort of got together on our, on our end and we came up with this idea uh, of thank you because. Uh, 
Uh, Pierre, do you want me to talk it through or do you want to do it? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, I, I'll just, I'll say a quick thing. I'll throw it back to you, yeah. Kelly, because yeah. I, I just want to address this question that, that Mara posed in the, in, the, in the chat, which I think is a really good one. Uh, great point about relinquishing control that takes trust. Any pointers on that? And I think actually uh, that ties very directly to this idea of yes. gratitude for information in that um, I, in order to relinquish that control, I have to be focused on something other than the outcome. Because if I'm focused on the outcome, ultimately there is only one outcome, right? Uh, in any given situation, when we talk about it, we, when we take action, there, there is a single outcome that emerges. Uh, so if our conversation is only ever focused on the outcome, uh, it really sets us up to have what would I, I would describe as a zero sum game where either I get my way or you get your way. But if you focus on interests rather than outcomes, if you focus on what matters to me about the outcome and what matters to you about the outcome, it opens up the door to finding an outcome that actually solves for both of those things. And so this, this idea of gratitude is central to finding those outcomes, finding those positive some, some results where we both get to get to sort of solve for the thing that's important to us. Kelly, let me throw it back to you. Yeah, and, and so thank you because become, becomes uh, that. And in, in practice, when we have people find something benign uh, that they disagree about, like you know uh, chunky peanut butter versus smooth peanut butter, uh, and we have them uh, practice this, this thank you because. So you thank the person for the information, which does set, aside, set off the gratitude part of the brain, that the because becomes kind of central. You have to find some point of agreement uh, that, that you can move the conversation forward. So uh, I had this in real life it happened to me when my daughter was ill, uh, one of her best friend's parents are anti-vaxxers. And we wanted to maintain this relationship, but it was like, well, I can't yes and this. So what happens when I thank you because, which is I thank them for sharing their information. And I found the, 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 the link we had, which was we both cared for our children so much, we didn't want them to be hurt. And when both parties understood that, we were gonna do what we felt was best and we could move forward. So they, they FaceTimed and they chatted, they weren't in person when she was sick. So it, it's, it's, and we've actually run, this, there's a paper coming out next year. Uh, we've run this study thousands and thousands of times. And what's really interesting is the paper was supposed to be done this year, but we decided uh, that we wanted to try this exercise when only one party said, thank you, because. So I'm curious thinking about this, do you think people still stayed in conversations longer, felt they were more fruitful if only one party did it? Yeah, I, I'm seeing in the chat a lot of great stuff uh, around the idea that we do live in a very much, especially the corporate world is a very no world. And yep. usually I would say that you're not alone in, in saying that a lot of times it's not a direct no, it's this sort of more indirect yes, but where we feel better about ourselves about saying no, but we're still saying no, right? Um, so again, I'll bring us back to this idea that uh, for us, especially, you know, we, we are, our, our, our art form is collaborative. I, there's no such thing as, as me winning the scene or you winning the scene. And in fact, if either of us have that, that attitude, typically the whole scene is lost because uh, it's not a competition. It, it truly is one of the great examples of, of collaborative teamwork, of, of, of uh, having a, uh, uh, an outcome that must solve for both, uh, both uh, the interests of both individuals. Um, it's good. not the default. That's not at all the default, right? You really have to do some work at that. Sorry, Cal, go ahead. No, I'm just seeing this thing that Andrew mentioned, is there a stab you from the front way of doing this? Uh, I don't know that I have that, but I have a very quick story that I love to tell about this. And I got it from Sunil Gupta's book, Backable. Uh, and he talks about a primatologist by the name of George Shatter, uh, who was working in the 1950s in Central Africa. Uh, he was the mentor to Diane Fossey, Gorillas in the Mist. Uh, and uh, Shatter was amazing. He got closer uh, to the gorillas. Uh, he got greater data. And at a conference, a woman raised her hand and said, you know, how is it that you can do this when no one else of your peers can do it? And he goes, oh, it's because I don't carry a gun in my backpack. So this is such a great metaphor. It doesn't have to be right in front. We know the people who are carrying guns in their backpack and we know the people who aren't. And so as Pierre was talking about the mindset, that is the thing that is important. That is the, like people will know when you approach with gratitude, I, the, one of the phrases I love is you need to replace blame with curiosity. 
When you replace blame with curiosity, you have an opportunity to make all sorts of co-discoveries because we don't do this alone. And this is the mistaken business. The mistaken business around zero sum is somehow thinking that if like I need to win, when in fact you need everyone to be on the same page and working together in order to succeed. You need diverse amounts of voices. And I don't, I mean, every kind of diverse uh, a voice, you know, kind of voice. Uh, Heifetz at Harvard calls it being on the uh, balcony in the dance floor. You know, you need to look at all the whole, and that's very much an improv sensibility. And we have tons of these kinds of exercises that address it, just that. I think I'll also quickly point out that the because part of thank you becomes because also is very, very important. And the reason for that is it is very easy in many of these cases to do lip service to an idea, whether you're talking about yes and or thank you. It's very easy to say that phrase uh, and sort of treat it like, oh, I've inserted that that person feels valued, they feel appreciated, right? Uh, I, I always am careful to distinguish between making someone feel appreciated and making sure that someone is appreciated. Uh, that distinction becomes very, very important, uh, not because they don't feel, not because of the feeling factor. If people are appreciated, typically they also feel appreciated. But if you only focus on the idea of how pe other people feel, it, it, it can uh, direct us into that sort of like manipulation tactic, right? That idea that it matters more how they feel than what is actually happening. Uh, and the because, and thank you because, forces me to do some work. It forces me to do the, the, the very tough introspection of what, what am I truly authentically grateful for in what the other person has said. That is, you, you will find if you try this out, not an immediate thing. You actually have to take some time to figure that out for yourself. And what, what is super exciting to me about this particular uh, uh, technique or exercise is when you do that, a lot of times you learn something more about yourself. That You learn about the underlying motivation for why you feel a certain way so that you can bring that to your next conversation as well. I a think lot of people are mentioning. At, oh yeah, go ahead, go. I've, I've kept, we're kind of jumping to Q and I think at this point, yeah. there's so much in here, but a lot of people are mentioning how hard this is and that, that businesses don't operate like that. It's like, yes, do you see the world we fucking live in right now? It's a goddamn mess because of that. And, yeah. and, and honestly, the, the, what we've discovered and there's literature around this is like, it's very hard to tackle this at an individual level and at an institution-wide level, I like to focus on teams. And I think if you focus on teams, and, and the literature I've seen on this is, is that if you've got a good leader in your team, you're probably sticking with it, uh, even when there's other dysfunctional teams around. So it's a very much, a, and, and we use the term ensemble at Second City. And uh, the late, great Sheldon Patekin, who was an early artistic director here, uh, used to point out that there's the phrase, your team is only as good as its weakest member. And what he used to say is, no, your team is only as good as its ability to compensate for its weakest member. Because at some point, we're gonna be the weakest member and we need the other person to sort of chime in and, and feel uh, empowered to do so. And that's a very improv thing. Yeah, I agree. Uh, right, I anyways. think, yeah, we'd, we'd love to take some questions, I think, uh, if, if there are any, I'm seeing a few in the chat. Uh, feel free to, to go ahead and add, add more. Uh, in the meantime, I will uh, speak okay. to Andrews. Um, Andrew, Andrew says, so this, uh, this is uh, very interesting because we create the environments based on our cultural and belief, cult culture and beliefs. How might we improve in the creation of these safe spaces for dialogue and positivity? So one thing I'll say to that is uh, we work hard not to define them as safe spaces because we can't promise that they will be. Uh, we don't know what that space will be like. Uh, we describe them often as brave spaces, the idea where you're, we're gonna ask you to step a little bit outside your comfort zone. Uh, we're, we're gonna do everything in our power to, so, that, so that you're, when you do that, you're in a sort of a learning space as opposed to a trauma space. Um, but we, we must acknowledge that any element of the unknown involves some risk. Um, and I think that is actually one way that you establish that trust is by sort of acknowledging that, that, uh, that the space that you're entering into is one where we, we don't have control over all those factors. Kel? Yeah, so someone's asking about how you apply this into areas like inclusion and talking about race. That's kind of the foundational thing here. Uh, so as Piero knows, we created with Heather uh, for the University of Chicago, uh, a bunch of their orientation programs that are all built upon really on that. And Heather right now is the Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at UCLA. Um, and, and, and her approach to it is, is basically working from the knowledge that most DE&I training doesn't work because people immediately go to their shame brain um, and they, they push back. And so the way she phrases it, and I love it, is like, if we can just get individuals to realize they treat people differently, and that has consequences, that gives us a baseline for potential growth and change. Um, and there's that, and so because we all share, it, we all have these biases. 
I, I was literally in a conversation with a, a, a higher up at the AMA who started telling me about how all biases are bad and like they're, they're biases, they're built in our brain. They're like, they're not bad and they're not good, they are. Uh, and so I, we think this work and we do a lot of work in the inclusion space because improvisation is all about uh, speaking through difference um, and, and asking questions and getting to know each other and being eternally curious and all those things. So uh, I think there's great value. In fact, we're building a program with uh, Duke Corporate Education on building inclusive teams where they're bringing the evidence and we're bringing the improv training. And that's gonna be like self-paced uh, learning that people can do online. So coming out next year. All right, what uh, else Kelly, we got, uh, I'm seeing a comment that you can sort of speak to in just a moment on uh, psychological safety, the research yep. done by Amy Edmondson. Yep. Um, before you jump to that, I'll, I'll uh, ex address uh, Alexandra's comment uh, with this idea of like, you know, uh, moving into sort of building on your comment, Kelly, of moving into these these conversations. Um, and sorry, uh, uh, and also Paul's Paul's comment here, this idea of suggesting eliminating the but, uh, everything before the but is BS and changing it to and. So Paul, 100% agreed. Um, one thing that I will add is that unfortunately, uh, and is also not a magic spell. So we even sometimes hear people say, yes, and but. Right, <laughs> where uh, that, that's still not authentic. Yes, and so the 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 one thing that I would uh, sort of encourage you to think about changing your your butt to an and is wonderful. It's it, it's a great way to nudge you in the right direction. Um, but if you're not then examining what follows, then you're probably not using yes and authentically. So this is not a matter of find replace changing your butt to and. This is a matter of if I condition myself to say yes and instead of say yes but, how does that affect the rest of the sentence? And if it's, if, if it's changing how you then respond, then, then chances are it is nudging you towards that yes and philosophy. But ultimately what, what, what I would suggest is if yes and fits the sentence, by all means, please use it to nudge your, your way towards that, towards that philosophy. If it doesn't fit, please, please, please don't use yes and verbally. Instead, use it internally. Use the yes to remind yourself, yes, listen more. The and to remind yourself, and it's my job to also contribute. It's my responsibility to contribute uh, to this dialogue and to this conversation. If it fits verbally, great, but if it doesn't, use it internally. Don't, don't, don't try to hand fist it in if it's not fitting. Kelly, uh, thoughts on uh, that, that uh, comment on psychological, on psychological safety? safety? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've talked to Amy about, about this and, and, and her work's amazing and, and indeed, uh, improvisation. What we know about improvisers is they can't do their work effectively if they're operating in their fear brain. Um, and so we have to create these uh, psychologically safe environments in which they create. So one example of that from our theater uh, is that we, when we go into process for creating a review, and that is basically six actors and a director with a stage manager or a musical director, that's the ensemble that we're talking about that's creating this review, especially in the early stage, this is what we call the yes and stage, first four weeks, um, I'm not allowed to go in that room. I'm not allowed to watch rehearsals. I'm not allowed to come to the show. Uh, I'm not allowed to come to the improv set until the director sort of says, yep, yeah, here, invite, invite you in. We're ready to show you some stuff. And in part, that's just like, don't put those eyes on them when they're in their creative space, which is a non-judgment space. As a boss, I'm a judge. Um, and so they don't need judges at that time. They do later. And that, then that absolutely happens. So early stage ideation is absolutely, that's yes and, that's psychologically safe, that's, that's all that. And then it move, when we move from, creativity, non-judgment, to innovation when we're making things, that's when we bring in judgment and other stuff. And we have to learn how to like pitch, pitch back and forth as we're developing. It's, it's also a Kahneman system on system two is, is improv. That, that's, that's what you're constantly doing when you're working without a script. Um, what else we got in here, Piero? Kelly, we've got a number of requests for uh, book list rep recommendations for you. Uh, while you're thinking about what to, what to, what to sort of throw, throw yeah. to people, uh, and they have, there's also been a request for what's on your bookshelf behind you. Um, I'll yeah. quickly address Ellen's point here. Of, uh, you've heard people say, I, I agree to disagree. And I think that's, it's, that's really an interesting one because we actually hear that a lot, right? Let, oh, let's just agree to disagree, which often is the end of a conversation, right? We're gonna, we're gonna debate something a bunch. We're not gonna find any common ground. And then we're just gonna walk away by saying, let's just agree to disagree. Sometimes we need to be in that space. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not trying to suggest that, that like, so sometimes that's appropriate. But if you, can, if you can shift the conversation to, uh, uh, I wanna better understand what it is we disagree about and what it is that we agree about. Uh, and actually even more importantly, and this is the thing that is so not intuitive, but so super valuable, is I want to uh, work 
to appreciate what is different about your perspective, what I don't relate to. I want to better understand it. I want to better see where you're coming from uh, because uh, that allows for complementarity. So I'll, I'll give the example of like, if I'm a, if I'm a, a language person and, uh, you know, and I don't get, I don't get math, I don't get numbers. It's very easy for me to sort of distance myself from math people. Right. I can, I can basically be like, Oh, I'm, 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 I'm a words person. Here are all my words, people, these people I understand. Great. Uh, you know, who I don't understand is all these math people. They seem like total weirdos to me. I can't figure out what, what makes them tick. And so I'm just going to like agree to disagree. Math is not my thing. But if I can invest the work in trying to understand what, what people are passionate about in that way, now when it comes to a time where we have to work together and, and whatever the task is requires a, a, a verbal component and a math component, now we have those two pieces of the puzzle. Versus if I've only spent time forming bonds with uh, the people that are, that are like me, that, that, that share sameness, uh, typically there's a deficit. This goes back to Kelly's point of your ability to compensate for the weakest link. Um, the, the, the real important insight in my mind here is that we gravitate towards sameness. Uh, and so we, we form these bonds very naturally with people that we are similar to uh, and, and along the lines of what we are similar to them about. You even hear politicians saying like, we have more in common than, than, than we have that, that, that divides us. Um, and that's great. We're not suggesting, you know, like, please, by all means, please form bonds with people based on similarity, but also start to work that muscle of forming bonds with people over difference, over the fact that you and I are very different in this way. And I may not be passionate about the thing that you're passionate about uh, in the same way that you are, but I have put in the work to, think, to understand so when we have a conversation so that I know why that is true for you. Kelly, let me throw back to you. Uh, Kelly Leonard Book Club, let's move to it. Uh, so the three books that are holding up my computer are Sherry Turkle's Reclaiming Conversation, uh, Kahneman uh, Noise, his, his new book, and I'm thanked in it because I got to read and give notes on, on early chapters, and then Stanford's own Jennifer Ocker's Humor Seriously. Uh, my wife and I are in the origin story of, of, of that book, which is fun. All right, Mind Wise by Nick Epley. So Nick is the researcher that Piero uh, and my wife Anne and, and our friend Jen uh, uh, all worked with, and is a lot of this stuff that we're talking about is grounded in his research. Uh, Seth Stevens Davidovitz, Everybody Lies, is an incredible book about big data, new data, and what the internet can tell us about what we really are. Uh, and then a book that's not out yet, I just interviewed him for, I host a podcast for getting the yes and, please subscribe. It's called The Power of Us by Jay Van Babel and Dominic Packer, which is about harnessing our shared identities to improve performance, increase cooperation, and promote social harmony. So it's all about how our identities are inherently social and they're not fixed and they change dep depending on what group we're with or what, what type of group we're in. Um, really fascinating book. I highly recommend it. Uh, so how much time we got left? Do we have time for another? We have like three minutes. Three minutes. I'll, 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 I'll respond to a few things here. Uh, humor seriously oh, with the yeah, yeah, Sorry, more. Jeremy, yeah, jump in, feel free. Do, do one more question, Piero, and then I'll uh, and then I'll wrap with a couple of closing remarks. Sure, great. that sounds great. So I'll just I'll just quickly say uh, there there have been a couple uh, questions here around um, uh, uh, this idea of like how do people how do we train how do we how do we train in doing this? I, again, you can find little things in everyday life. One of the big things is be more others focused. Whether that means uh, being more curious, trying to learn more about people, uh, working to remember people's names, right? Any of these little, little things that can still help train your brain to be more open and be more in that space. Um, and uh, just to address Hillary's question here, uh, can, uh, sort of creating a container for difficult, difficult conversations, I would say that this thank you because idea is, is one of our central ideas there, is, is the idea that uh, you, training people in, in this, this art of having a conversation where you are not looking to win the conversation. You're not looking to convince the other person. You're sim you're actually go your goal is actually to change yourself. Your goal is to, to better understand where that other person is coming from. That can help keep you in that, that uh, difficult conversation. Jeremy? Ama amazing. Can we all, um, let's put it in a gallery view if you can, because uh, Piero and Kelly, we want to do something that we try to do at the end of all these, and that's give fireworks applause. Can everybody please give fireworks <laughs> applause to Piero and Kelly? Excellent. Thank you so much. It's been an amazingly illuminating. I wish I just tweeted, I wish I had the bandwidth to live tweet this session because there are so many gems. I mean, you guys are incredible. And we thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and experience with us.